Great. Uh, welcome all to uh, another session of the Galactic Fidelity uh, seminar series. And uh, you, can, you, you can see that you are all muted when entering. Uh, please uh, keep your questions till the end, uh, at which time uh, you can either uh, uh, add them on the chat or uh, ask them uh, verbally uh, to the speaker. Okay, I think we just wait for it, Eric to add. Yeah. Okay, so it's a pleasure to introduce uh, uh, Victor. Um, Victor uh, is a member of the Extra Galactic Astrophysics Research Group at uh, University of um, Lancashire. And uh, Victor leads the Galaxy Dynamics Group, uh, which studies the formation and evolution of uh, galaxies on scales spanning from uh, the range of nuclei to bulges, disks, and uh, their dark matter halos. Uh, his research is uh, organized around three themes. And uh, these are nuclei, bulges, and scaling relations. Uh, Stellar migration in disks and the interaction of baryons and dark matter halos. And uh, uh, Victor uses uh, state of the art supercomputer simulations and modeling techniques to study how disk galaxies form and evolve. Today, we are going to uh, hear a talk from him, which is using simulations and bar and box peanut bulge. Um, over to you, Victor. Okay, thank you. Um, I hope my bandwidth holds. Um, if not, I will uh, turn off my video. You don't need to see me. Um, let me share my screen first. Okay, I hope you can see my screen at this point. Let's minimize that. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, thank you. Yes, we can see your screen. Okay. Thank you. So, well, first of all, thank you. It's a great honor to be giving this presentation. Um, I thought I would talk to you a little bit about uh, some of the work we do in my group about understanding the formation of box peanut bulges and, and bars and their evolution. And at the moment, there's a lot of work going on around the subject, in part because of the Gaia satellite and part trying to understand the Milky Way better. Uh, so that's what I'm going to talk about. And at the end, what I would like to end with uh, is that I understand that the audience is comprised in part of master students and PhD students. And so I have a few exercises based on an end body simulation where uh, I will uh, present to you some, I will present to you a simulation that roughly matches the Milky Way uh, and that you can use to try to measure some things about, about barred galaxies in general and their box peanut bulges. So, uh, right, without further ado, uh, as you're probably well aware, uh, we classify galaxies uh, using, well, the simplest way is using Hubble's classification scheme into um, elliptical galaxies. Uh, and then we have the tuning fork diagram, uh, the, the two arms of the tuning fork, the spiral galaxies and the barred galaxies. And what this talk will be about is this branch of Hubble's classification scheme. Uh, so why should we study bars? There's a number of reasons I can give you, uh, and, which I've listed here, but there's more. One is that they are extremely common. Uh, I will show you on the next slides that roughly three quarters of all disk galaxies are, are barred galaxies uh, at some level. And given that the majority of galaxies are, are disk galaxies, not elliptical, at least the large ones, that means that uh, bars are actually important to understand. The Milky Way and Andromeda galaxy are barred. Uh, the nearest big galaxies are barred, so we need to understand them. Uh, balls play a very important role in the evolution of bulges, which is what I'll be talking about today. They also play a role in the evolution of disks, uh, even in the solar neighborhood, uh, 8.2 8 kiloparsecs away from the galactic center, we can see the effect of the bar 
the bar we think is about five kiloparsecs long. So we're a few kiloparsecs out from the end of the bar, but nonetheless, the bar makes itself felt in our neighborhood. Bars also drive gas inwards uh, into the center of the galaxy, which can lead to a number of effects. One of, bit, one of which has been hypothesized to be that bars help to feed supermassive black holes. I'm not going to talk about that subject here. We have done a tiny bit of work ar around that, uh, but this is an old topic that goes back to the 1980s. And also on point seven, I, I'm only mentioning it here. This actually goes back to my PhD thesis that bars can help us probe the density of dark matter halos by breaking a symmetry, uh, basically that you have a broken, they're no longer, galaxies are no longer axisymmetric once they have a bar. And so that allows you to try to measure the mass of the disks better. But I'll mostly focus here on point three, uh, and in particular within the context of the Milky Way being a barred galaxy. And so that's what I'll be talking about. So let's start by looking a little bit at statistics of barred galaxies. Uh, in the traditional view, we, we had RC3 classifications of galaxies. And RC3 was a classification scheme uh, and catalog based on photographic plates. Photog photographic plates are um, most uh, sensitive to blue light. And so here's an example of a galaxy, NGC 5161, shown on the left, uh, where here you see the B band image, and here you see the H band in the infrared. And whereas you can see that there is some kind of an elongation in the center in H band, that is hard to see in the B. Whoops, sorry. Uh, that is hard to see in the B. And this has led to the re realization that the sort of historical classifications we had up to the sort of year 2000 uh, of the fraction of barred galaxies, which at the time we thought it was about one third of galaxies, in fact needed, needed revising. And here I have a little bit of a matrix of the old RC3 classifications versus the age band classifications from a study by Eskridge et al. Um, and uh, what the conclusion of that is, is that the fraction of strongly barred galaxies, when you go from B band to age band goes from being about uh, 56%, uh, sorry, goes from about being about 36% to about 56%, uh, more than half of all disk galaxies are strongly barred. And then if you include the weakly barred SABs, uh, then the, the fraction goes from the 66% to 73%. So clearly these are very common galaxies. Three quarters of disk galaxies have bars in them. So uh, it's important for us to understand the dynamics of bars. Now, when we want to also look at the uh, cosmic evolution of the bar fraction, we need to be aware of uh, a very important effect that happens as we look to earlier and earlier redshift, we're looking further and further into, into uh, wavelengths that are bluer and bluer basically, because by the time they reach us, they've been red redshifted into bands that we observe. And that means that, that, these, they're, that we're observing galaxies and the rest blue or ultraviolet. And um, galaxies that are barred are typically, don't prominently display their bar in blue bands or, or in the UV. Uh, we saw this already in this, in this image that the bar is not very prominent in B in this particular case because of dust obscuration. But also uh, if you're looking at a tracer that is more sensitive to young stars, which is what B is, what H alpha is for instance, the bars themselves don't tend to have a lot of young star formation going on except at their centers. And their centers generally look round. And so if we look at an H alpha image, for instance, of, of a galaxy, we can't really tell that there's a bar in there. We see that there's maybe a hole in the center, which might tell us maybe there's a bar in there, but that doesn't need to be the case. And indeed, that if we look at the infrared, we can clearly see that there's a bar there, whereas there isn't one in H alpha or in B. So that is something to be wary of. Uh, that band shifting becomes important, particularly when we start looking at redshifts larger than 0.7. Nonetheless, there have been studies uh, using um, uh, Cosmos uh, and other studies uh, looking at galaxies of at higher redshifts all the way to redshifts roughly of one. And what we seem to find based on both a visual classification and on uh, ellipticity, fitting, uh, fitting ellipses, 
classification is that the fraction of strong bars declines with redshift and the fraction of all bars, so weakly barred and strongly barred also declines with redshift. So that's an interesting uh, result that the fraction of barred galaxies increasing as you get to later and later times. Um, there's also been studies of how that, that varies as a function of, um, of mass of the galaxy. So if we look at redshift between 0.14 and 0.37, we have a relatively flat distribution of bar fractions. And as we look to increasingly large redshifts, that fraction seems to decline. And it seems to decline at all masses with some hint that the larger galaxies uh, have, have higher total bar fraction. And what's interesting is that, um, you know, besides the fact that this fraction is decreasing, is that there seems to be some kind of a consensus uh, that has emerged on how the bar fraction is evolving with redshift. So this is again all galaxies here, and the strongly sorry all bar all types of bars, weak and strongly barred galaxies, and this is from the same study those that have. Um, in the stronger bars, uh, you see there's a decrease towards um, high redshift. And then there's different colored points here, uh, which come from different studies, and they seem to be broadly in agreement, okay? Now, this should come with a little bit of a caveat, uh, and that comes from the following um, result. Uh, there has been a survey in infrared called S4G, uh, that's with Spitzer, which has a very high resolution. It's a space-based space satellite, so it has a relatively high resolution. That's a rather than very high resolution. Um, and so I'm going to show you the results of a study by Erwin et al, who studied the, the bars of galaxies that are well resolved. So if you plot the bar size versus the distance of the galaxy, and then you plot these different lines over here where if you know what the full width, full width half mass of the seeing of, of Spitzer is, you can work out what twice the full width half max is, uh, three times the full width half max, four and five. And you'll notice that there are very few galaxies that fall below this line of two times the full width half max, which tells you that smaller bars are hard to detect. Okay, uh, and that will probably be, or the, it's hard to detect the, the bars of such galaxies, not so much, of course, the galaxy itself is visible. You see, this is the bar size that's being plotted on, on this axis. You don't see over here very many galaxies, but this is a very short distance scale. So we expect there to be galaxies like this one over here, but we don't detect them 50 uh, megaparsecs out where the full width half max or rather where the seeing is um, you know, uh, uh, large, large enough that you don't, you, don't, you don't have the bar within two full width half maxes of, uh, of the satellite seeing. So um, what Erwin did, then he took a sample of galaxies within 25 kiloparsecs that was complete, had to be complete through all this volume. So uh, from this mass upwards, all galaxies that are, uh, within that distance and studied the properties of the bars of these systems and asked, what is the bar fraction uh, across this mass range? And uh, what you see is that he has a sort of peaked distribution, uh, peaks that are about, um, you know, nine, log, log mass of about 9.6, 9.7, something like that. Now, what's interesting is that when you compare this with other studies, for instance, ground-based studies based on SDSS, those fractions are extremely different. Uh, there doesn't seem to be an agreement. And so what, what is happening here? Uh, well, first of all, let's note that the, what changes, you know, there's a little bit of a difference, a, a bit of an evolution on this end, or there's a little bit of a variation rather than an evolution. Um, uh, the low mass galaxies tend to have less and less bars. And then it's, it's peaked, possibly slightly flattened. Um, 
Well, what happens is that the strong, the fraction of strong bars and low mass galaxies drops dramatically uh, and then more or less stays flat at higher masses. Whereas the fraction of weakly barred galaxies is more or less flat across the entire range. So the, the variation is happening in the strong bars at low mass. Now, why is there um, some of this variation? Well, um, let's look at some of the effects of some of these variations, some of the results that have been quoted in the literature. Uh, one of the results that might at first sight seem very obvious is that the, if you look as a function of color, as you look towards redder galaxies, the fraction of barred galaxies increases. And that's what these gray squares and triangles are indicating. That's a study based on SDSS. Uh, but this S4G sample, this very well resolved sample that Erwin et al was looking at, or Erwin was looking at, is, is fairly flat. There isn't, there's a huge difference between these two studies. There isn't the strong dependence on the color. Now, I would have naively expected, in fact, a, a dependence on the color because when a bar forms, it inhibits star formation, at least within it. Uh, and so therefore you expect galaxies that have bars to be redder. But apparently the, the, the universe is telling us otherwise. <laughs> there, there doesn't seem to be a strong dependence. For similar reasons, observations seem to suggest that as the gas mass fraction increases, the fraction of bars decreases. But well, S4G seems to be saying something different. What the reason for all this appears to be is the differences in resolution. That if you go to S4G, the typical resolution for the distance scale that we were looking at, remember we went up to 25 or 30 uh, megaparsecs, that typical resolution ends up being about 165 parsecs. Instead, the SDSS resolution corresponds to about 1.25 kiloparsecs, almost uh, an order of magnitude higher. And so, um, that may be why this difference is happening. And there's an additional experiment that happens that suggests strongly that that's what's going on. First, let's note that the sizes of bars depend relatively flatly on the mass of the galaxy below a certain mass, below a mass that is roughly the mass of the Milky Way. Not quite, but a little bit below. And then it increases as a power law. Notice that this is a log scale. Over here. Okay. Yes? Go on. Sorry to interrupt you. We, we lost That's you good. for a couple of slides there. Could you switch off your video? And sure. Uh, where do I do that now? Hold on a second, please. Uh, uh, can you still see my screen? Yes. 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 So is this better? Okay, okay, right. So I was saying that the, the sizes of bars can be fitted by a, a broken power law, basically. Um, that, the relatively flat, uh, low galaxy mass, and then increases quite rapidly at higher galaxy mass. Right, and there is of course quite a bit of scatter. Now let's start looking at what happens at different resolutions. Suppose these are, this is the observed galaxy size, therefore, okay and the different symbols are different galaxies. Uh, and we look at the full width half max of S4G, twice the full width half max of S4G. And then we look at uh, the full width half max of uh, Galaxy Zoo, sorry, of, of SDSS, not Galaxy Zoo. Uh, these are Galaxy Zoo studies. And then twice that. Okay. And what you see is that there is a lot of galaxies below these cuts that if, if, we, if we adopt twice the full width half max as the seeing limit within which you can see a bar, that SDSS based studies would miss a lot of bars. Uh, the same would be true in terms of color, that a lot of blue galaxies with bars would be missed at, at the SDSS resolution. And the same is true also for gas. There are other correlations that happen, color, correlates with mass, et cetera. Uh, so you, you actually expect to be missing a large fraction of bars. And then you would think, especially if we come here, that the bar fraction rises very rapidly as a function of mass. 
So what if we try to mimic, mimic that directly and say, let's pretend we don't see most of these bars down here, what happens? Then that's the study. Uh, this is uh, the, the raw sample, the, the red points. And then if you take these galaxies and you pretend that you don't see galaxies below this line, uh, then you obtain these blue points over here. And those are very close to the SDSS results, which tells us that in fact, the universe probably has a very large fraction of barred galaxies. Uh, those barred galaxies uh, are not a strong function of galaxy mass, not a very strong function of uh, the color of the galaxy. There are some dependencies, but they're not incredibly strong. So bottom line of the studies are that the universe uh, has barred galaxies at high mass and at low mass in quite significant proportions. Now let's switch to you know one barred galaxy that we work on a lot, which is the Milky Way. Uh, on the top panel here, I'm showing you what the Milky Way in visual looks like. Well, as you I'm sure are aware, it's just a, a mess of dust. We don't see very much in the center. But when you look in the infrared, this is what you see. You can see the bulge over here. And if you look closely at that, you can see that this looks a little bit more vertically extended this side than this side. And that is just purely a perspective of effect of living within a galaxy. Well, that's obviously relatively nearby. The bulge is uh, about three kiloparsecs in radius, so only five kiloparsecs away from us. Living within a bulge that is not axisymmetric, but rather that is um, triaxial. And this is the near side of the bulge. This is the far side of the bulge. Therefore, this side appears large to us on the sky. This side appears small to us on the sky. And it really was images like this, in fact, probably this very image, that first convinced people that the Milky Way is barred. Uh, this, was, this was sometime around 1994 or so. Uh, the Vokaler had argued that the Milky Way had a bar long before that, but nobody really took that view very seriously. People, people were happier to talk about explosions in the center of the Milky Way rather than the Milky Way being barred. Now we know, of course, it, it's typical for galaxies like the Milky Way to have bars, but at the time this was thought to be a somewhat unusual suggestion. Uh, but there you go, the Milky Way is a barred galaxy. Uh, and it turns out the Milky Way is not the only galaxy in the local group that is bored. If we look at Andromeda, uh, you can see maybe that this is a little bit boxy. And then there are these two things sticking out. If you look in the contours, you can clearly see that this looks boxy. Whereas if you fit ellipses, the ellipses are significantly more rounded. This we think is the signature of uh, the Milky Way having a box peanut bulge, okay, that's what we refer to these things as. And that, that yeah, therefore means that the Milky Way is a part galaxy for reasons we'll see shortly. Okay, let's uh, look at other galaxies in general that have these kinds of bulges. Here's NGC 5746. Uh, this is not a perfectly edge on galaxy, but you can see that this looks fairly boxy, okay. And here is a simulation of a barred galaxy seen edge on. For those of you that will try the exercises, one of the things that you want to do is look at precisely things like this. And this is one of the galaxies you will be looking at, or the galaxy you will be looking at, this, this one in, in the simulation. And so this has led to the idea, uh, first put forward by comms and collaborator, uh, collaborators, that um, when you see one of these box peanut bulges, what you're really seeing is the presence of a, of a bar. Uh, and this is just the vertically thickened part of the bar. Okay, uh, so a number of authors, uh, particular bureau and collaborators sought to make this connection. Uh, and they did this in a number of ways by looking at these edge on box peanut bulges. They looked at the gas chemistry and then they saw this figure of eight, which is something that you expect when there's a bar. However, you can also get something like that uh, if there is a gas ring without a bar. So this is not a definitive proof that there is a bar in this galaxy. And in order to show that there is a, a bar with a galaxy like this, what you want to do is you want to look at the stellar kinematics. And one of the things that comes out of stellar kinematics is that when there is a bar, uh, one of the things you expect is that the H3 moment, 
Winkowski meet third or third order moment, which measures the skewness of the line of sight velocity distribution, is correlated with the uh, um, with the velocity field. Now that doesn't usually happen. Uh, usually you expect an anti-correlation. So here's an example of a, from a simulation. This is the um, perfectly axisymmetric system. That's the rotation curve. Uh, and you see that when there's a disk, you, you expect an anti-correlation. This is increasing. This is decreasing. That's the rotation velocity. This is H3. And that's telling you that this galaxy does not have a bar. When the simulation was evolved further, you can see a strong bar has formed. Uh, and then what you have is there's a decreasing velocity along there. And H3 is also decreasing. So there's a correlation between H3 and the velocity. It's not an anti-correlation, it's a correlation. And that is the evidence, the strongest evidence of the presence of a bar in, in an edge-on galaxy. Uh, and this has been done for real galaxies. Uh, so if, if you look at some of these, um, let's see which one's very clear. Um, this one, for instance, there's a box peanut bulge in there. You see the velocity is increasing this way and the H3 moment is increasing in the inner part. And this is the region within which there is a bar. You'll notice there's a little bit of an anti-correlation at the very center. That means this galaxy has a small nuclear disk uh, where again, you end up with an anti-correlation in that case, but in the region of the bar, there is a correlation. And there's several other galaxies here that do something very similar. Uh, this one, you have a small region of anti-correlation and then a region of correlation. Again, H3 is increasing where the velocity is increasing. So, um, right, so, uh, and in, in their sample of 24 edge-on galaxies, 22 of them showed signs of having a bar. And in the other two, they, no, no, things weren't quite so clear. Another way of doing this is if you look at a galaxy and you produce an unsharp mask, an unsharp mask is a way of, mm looking at the very fine structure only. So you take an image and then you blur that image and then take, you take the difference or the ratio of those two images. You end up with looking at the sharp detailed structures in the galaxy. Uh, this is, I'm showing you this in a simulation uh, and the same is done for real galaxies. And then you get these X-shaped structures in galaxies that have box peanut bulges. Okay. So this is the evidence that um, these by comparing simulations and observations, bureau and collaborators and collaborators uh, show that um, most of these box peanut bulges have a bar in them. Now, some years later, uh, people started discovering uh, galaxies where you could see the box directly and you could also see the bar directly. So here's one example. You can see the box part directly and then there's the bar and you might be able to see faintly the rest of the disk over here. This is not perfectly edge-on, this is inclined by 65 degrees. Now, one of the things you will notice in this case is that this is the boxy part, this is the bulge part, but the bar is significantly longer. And so when this result came out and when Cormandy and Kennecott were reviewing the subject in 2004, one of the things that they worried about a lot was the fact that these two don't seem to have the same size. Why is it that you know it's not the entire bar that looks like it's boxy? Now, simulations have shown for quite a while that that is in fact what you expect, that they should not have the same size. Um, but it was not very well known at the time because people were studying edge-on galaxies. And that points to the problem, part of the problem with studying galaxies edge-on, that you don't really have a full view of what is going on in the galaxy. And so it would be nice if we could formalize a way of studying box peanut bulges rather than purely edge on uh, at general orientations. And that's what we have done uh, by recognizing that the boxy part is generally smaller than the bar itself. Uh, if you look in detail first at simulations and then at real galaxies, what happens uh, when there is a box peanut bulge, well, we see the bar, there's the bar over there. And then when there's a box peanut bulge, there's a boxy bit Okay, that's the vertically thickened part that's shown on this red contour over here. And then there are these, th these narrow little spurs that stick out. You will notice that they're misaligned with the major axis of the boxy bit. And this is a well-known thing that when you have uh, triaxial ellipsoids, 
that are co-centric, but they're not, they don't have the same uh, shapes, uh, in particular that some of them are thicker. When you project them, what you end up with are these isophotal twists. There's a twist, this is the major axis here, and the major axis is twisted at a different angle over there. And this is the signature of seeing box peanut bulges uh, at some inclination other than perfectly edge on. And the fact that we can do this now has allowed us to do a lot more, much more detailed studies, including uh, something that we couldn't test before, or we couldn't test clearly before, to study uh, the, the systematics of galaxies that have bars, but don't have box peanut bulges. How does the, how does the fraction of box peanut bulges vary as a function of properties of the galaxy within barred galaxies. So that's what we did. This is a sample of about 84 nearby, very well resolved uh, barred galaxies, barred galaxies, not disk galaxies. And we're plotting the fraction of those barred galaxies that have these box peanut bulges as a function of mass. And you will see that that's a very strong function of the mass. It rises very rapidly. There is this characteristic mass here of about 10.3, log of the mass of about 10.3. Mm. Uh, the mass of the Milky Way is somewhere in this yellow shaded region, uh, which tells you that the Milky Way should have a box peanut bulge. Uh, and um, yeah, it's, it's, it shouldn't be surprising to us that the Milky Way is one, one such galaxy, uh, now that, given that it has a bar. But you see, the, the, the part that is very puzzling is that there is this very strong transition from low probability of having a box spinner bulge to high probability of having a box spinner bulge. And so far, our studies have not been able to reveal why that is. Theory, myself included, had predicted that the, the way to suppress the sorts of instabilities that cause these box peanut bulges is by having a high gas fraction. It turns out that that is not borne out by the observations. So we're still learning how, how these things form. But one of the ways we think in which they form, and it's been known since the early uh, 1990s, is by galaxies suffering what's known as the buckling instability. That's where you're looking at the galaxy edge on, and the bar is perpendicular to your line of sight. And the bar, if the random motions become very large, uh, in the plane, it becomes uh, anisotropic, meaning that there's a lot of pressure in the plane, but very little in the vertical direction. And that drives it to an instability. And this instability here is known as a buckling instability. Uh, and so what happens is you go from a galaxy that is where the bar is relatively flat, but very anisotropic. Uh, this is shortly after the bar formed in this part. This is, this is, this is a simulation of sort of. So it's relatively flat. You see that the, the contours all line up very nicely. After the galaxy suffers this instability, you end up with this characteristic box plus spurs morphology where there is a isophotal twist. And so the cartoon is more or less like this, a boxy bit and spurs sticking, sticking out from it. But in between, it's gone through this phase uh, of the, the bending or buckling instability. And when that happens, what you end up with is again, a trapezoidal shape, trapezoidal boxy shape in the center. And then you have spurs again, but the spurs are on the same side on, uh, of, of the galaxy and, and on either side of the bar. So the, the cartoon is now more like a hat. Uh, and so that is the photometric signature of a, of a bar that is undergoing buckling. And now this phase is relatively short-lived in real galaxies, or at least in simulations we expected, from simulations we expect it to be short-lived about one or one and a half giga years. So it might be hard to detect. Uh, but here are two galaxies, especially look at this one, where you have a sort of trapezoidal shape followed by these spurs. And these spurs are on the same side of the galaxy in bo on both sides. So we think that this is a, a first de detection of a galaxy going through this buckling instability. And here's a second example that we discovered that we're still trying to uh, fully uh, verify. Now, one of the things we could do with four, four, five, six, nine was we could also look at the kinematics. Uh, you can imagine that when you're looking here versus you're looking there, remember we have a galaxy that's bent like this. So if our line of sight is somewhere like this, let's say, 
we have a different view, we have a different, different path through the galaxy this way versus this way. And so we might expect different kinematics and in particular we might expect different velocity dispersions on the two sides. So let's first plot the time evolution in, this, in, in the simulation that I showed you here, this one. Let's first plot the time evolution of the buckling amplitude or you know, the, this, the amplitude of the variation of the height of, the, of stars. That's nearly zero when it's flat, then it suddenly bends out of the plane. And this is the time basically when the galaxy is bending out of the plane. So that is when the buckling amplitude, sorry, that's when the buckling is happening. It doesn't matter exactly how we define this amplitude. Just the important point is that this is when the galaxy is buckling. Now, if we look at the difference in the velocity dispersion between this location and this location and plot that as a function of time in the simulation, we see that at that same time, a suddenly very large asymmetry between the two sides occurs. And that's just given by this simple expression here. So in this panel, what I'm plotting is a whole bunch of galaxies that are flat uh, shown by the gray points. Uh, the, sorry, the, the black points with gray, gray error bars. And then we're plotting um, a simulation, the simulation A that I showed you before, uh, before it buckled in green. So this, I'm, I'm plotting the radial variation of this. Okay, this is velocity dispersion asymmetry as a function of radius. And it's being normalized by the size of the box. This is the size of the box. Okay. Before it, it, the galaxy buckled, this is the profile of this quantity. It's fairly flat and close to zero, consistent with zero everywhere. After the galaxy buckled and settled into this state, if you take a difference between here and here, you find that in fact, there is very little difference. That's the purple points over here. But during this episode when the galaxy is buckling, there is this very strong variation between the velocity dispersion here and there. That's in the simulation, that's the purple point. The magenta points show you the observational values for this galaxy. And you see that there's a very strong signature there of the galaxy right now going through a violent buckling. So this is a galaxy that's suffering and instability right as we're seeing it. We can apply very similar techniques to high redshift galaxies using Cosmos. And the way we've done this is we've matched a sample of galaxies with high redshift up to redshift one with nearby galaxies. Um, the nearby galaxies are shown uh, as the black points over here. Nearby galaxies that have the same mass resolution the probability of having a bar as determined by the galaxy zoo volunteers and the same orientation inclination in this case. So each galaxy at high redshift from cosmos that has a bar is matched with a nearby galaxy uh, of comparable properties. And we ask the question, how often, remember these are all barred galaxies, how often do barred galaxies as a function of redshift have these box peanut bulges. And the fact that we're matching in you know, mass and resolution becomes important when we try to disentangle the effects of both resolution and cosmic evolution. So this is the nearby sample, okay? Uh, because of resolution effects, roughly one third of barred galaxies appear to have these box peanut bulges in total. Uh, then when we look, so that's a, ref a redshift roughly zero. When we look at the cosmos sample, that fraction seems to decline very rapidly. Now let's take these cosmos, no, sorry, let's take this SDSS sample and plot it out, pretending that they're uh, the same redshift as the galaxy that they're paired with. And when we do that, we get this effect. So this is the effect, you see this drop is just the effect of resolution. Uh, the lower the resolution in the galaxy, the harder it is to tell that there is a box being involved. You can see it directly here because these are all the purple points. These are all uh, uh, you know, in the local universe. This is not a cosmic evolution. We're just pretending that these galaxies are at different redshift, uh, at the redshift corresponding to their partner galaxy. But there's another thing that happens, which is as, as you go to further and further away in redshift, the higher and higher redshift, you have cosmic dimming. And that cosmic dimming uh, results in lower signal to noise. And when we take that into account, when we add noise to the 
to the real observed galaxies uh, and then re recompute whether we find a box peanut bulge, we get, we get something that is shown by these green points. So you see the, uh, the fraction drops quite considerably as you move out in redshift if you did that. So you go from having about 40% of galaxies with box peanut bulges to about 15% having them. Now, if we look at what Z Cosmos is, what Cosmos is doing though, we see that, that it's dropping even faster, which tells us that there has to be a real drop in the fraction of barred galaxies that have box peanut bulges. Moreover, because now we have the effect of both resolution and of, well, resolution plus uh, signal to noise, because we have those two effects taken or understood, we can correct for them. And then we recover the cosmic evolution of box peanut bulges, which is shown here. It is dropping. It becomes zero within our statistics. We only have four galaxies at redshift of one, but formally it's zero uh, at, at redshift of one, uh, and it declines fairly rapidly with redshift. Okay, that's interesting. You know, it's declining. The bar fraction is also declining, so maybe this is not surprising. But what is surprising is remember we had this uh, for local galaxies. We had this characteristic mass at which you transition from very few box peanut bulges to very many box peanut bulges. If we take these points and replot them here and then plot, uh, so this is uh, from the SDSS because the SDSS resolution is lower. That fraction is lower than the one at, uh, uh, from S4G at, or from, sorry, not S4G, this is not an S4G sample, from the high resolution survey. Um, this is, so this is redshift zero, as the SS. This is what you get at redshift less than 0.5. And this is what you get at redshift between 0.5 and one. And what seems to be happening is that the characteristic mass where this transition happens appears to be not evolving uh, since redshift of around one or about seven giga years ago. Now that is a very fascinating result. Why is that happening? Why is there this important transitional mass between uh, um, galaxies that have these box peanut bulges and those that don't. We really don't understand that. We're working on trying to understand it, but at the moment we don't have an answer to that. Turning back to the Milky Way. Uh, now in the Milky Way, I've already showed you that there is one of these, um, you know, there, there is a bulge, but how do we know that there is a box peanut bulge? The way we do that is in the orientation at which we're sitting in the Milky Way, we, are, we would be roughly over here and we're looking in this direction, okay? So as you see, our line of sight crosses one arm of this X shape or peanut shape. So you expect a high, high density somewhere here and then the density declines. And then you expect to run into another high density region uh, uh, before dropping off again. Now, if you had a standard candle, something like a red clump star, you might expect to see a peak at one magnitude, a dip in between, and then a peak at another, at another magnitude for the far arm. And that is indeed what we observe. This is again, indeed for red clump stars, you see there are two peaks. And that, those two peaks tell us that the Milky Way bulge is indeed shaped with what we now call is an X shape. Okay, it's a, you know, X shape, peanut shape. I, I, I've been using these terms a little bit uh, you know, like they're equivalent things. Uh, but that's how we know that the Milky Way has an X shape. And this is a map of the Milky Way bulge uh, as seen in red clump stars that was constructed by Wegg and Gerhardt uh, and then modeled further. Uh, and it's what we think the bulge would look like if the bar was perpendicular to our line of sight. The bar is not very far from directly along the line of sight. I'll show you that in a moment. So we don't actually see it like this, this very as clearly as this. We need to look at sort of these density, this double, these double density peaks at different magnitudes of standard candles. Here is another attempt like this. You see, you have location with one peak and the location with another peak in the line of sight distances. And so this is a cartoon of the Milky Way. We are sitting over here. That's the bar over there. This is positive longitude this way. This is negative longitude in this direction. If we look in this direction, we encounter the box peanut bulge 
on the near side and again on the far side. Oops. So in these regions, we expect to see these two peaks, like we said before. But if we go over in longitude too far, we will only intersect the bright peak. And so here's an example of that. There's only one peak over there. And that's for a region, for instance, like this. On the opposite side over here, we would hit two peaks uh, for some uh, longitudes. But then if we go further over, we only encounter the arm of the, of the box peanut bulge that is on the far side, so the faint one. And that's an example like this, okay? And that's this region over here. And so the Milky Way bulge has these characteristics that tell us that the Milky Way really does have this box peanut bulge. This is the galactic center. Uh, there aren't two arms uh, until you get to some distance away from the mid plane. Then once you're at a certain distance away from the mid plane, close to the minor axis, there's a region where you get two peaks. And then you get just a faint peak on one side and just a bright peak on the other side. Now, in terms of this interpretation, in terms of the interpretation that the box peanut bulge of the Milky Way is formed via a thickened, um, uh, a thickened bar, there have been a number of, uh, let's call them problems or puzzles uh, that we needed to understand. When we look at sort of this double peak in the density distribution along the line of sight, we see it very clearly in metal rich stars. That's this bin over here, A, of metal rich stars. But if we look at metal poor stars, we don't see something like that happening. And that is unclear why that would arise. We also don't see a strong bar uh, if we look at really old stars. This is R.R. Lyrae, that's at least 10 giga years old, maybe more. Whereas if we look at younger star, red clump stars, for instance, there is a very clear bar these stars are near us we're looking at positive longitude these stars are far away from us we're looking at ne negative longitude there's a vertical metallicity gradient how do you get a vertical metallicity gradient if all you're doing is puffing something up uh, why would that arise and the bulge appears to be uniformly old whereas if, it, if it's being thickened by something why just thicken it with the with the old stars why not see young stars as well so i'd like to explain a few of these trends for you uh, before sort of finishing off the talk. And what we realized a few years ago is that what bars are doing is they're causing stars to be separated based upon their, their initial uh, kinematics, by, based upon their initial random motions. And so we've come to call this kinematic fractionation. If you know, don't, don't know the word fractionation, you will probably have seen that possibly in chemistry, but if not, Fractionation is the process of separating out different uh, elements or, or, or um, compounds uh, in, 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 that are mixed together. Uh, so for instance, if you're distilling something, you're fractionating something, you're taking the alcohol out, leaving the water behind. Uh, and this is what galaxies with bars and then seem to be doing. And I'm, show, I'm going to show you first a toy model based on a simulation. This is how it, the simulation starts. This is an edge on view of the, of the galaxy. And this galaxy is comprised of five populations that I put in completely by hand. It's a toy model. Uh, there is a cool population and there's a hot population. The cool population would be something that we might imagine could be what you would expect for a young, for a young um, set of stars for a young population of stars. And because they're young, you expect them to be metal rich. And for an old population, uh, for a hot population, you expect those to be older and metal poor. But this is a simulation that is pure and body. There's no gas, there's no star formation. This is just my a posteriori interpretation of what these different things mean. And the fact that there are five populations is purely because I put them in by hand. There's no physics behind why I did this. It's because I knew what was, what, what, or I anticipated what was going to happen. They all have the same initial density, both in plane and in the vertical direction. They're all equally mixed. It's a perfect solution of five populations that have different amount of radial random motion to begin with. When I evolve this, uh, here's what I find. In the population that was initially very cool, I have a quite elongated bar. In the population that was initially hot, I have a significantly rounder bar, less elongated than this. 
if I look at John, the population that was initially cool is remains fairly thin. Population that was initially radially cool has thickened considerably. If you compare those two, there's a huge difference there. And the population that was radially cool has a strong X shape. The population that was radially hot doesn't have quite such a strong X shape. This is a purely, uh, you know, test model to show you how this can arise. We can now turn to self-consistently evolving simulations with gas and star formation, uh, where we expect the physics to be exactly the same. This is a simulation where all the stars formed out of gas. I didn't put in anything by hand. And at the end of the simulation that's been evolved for 10 giga years, we have a nice strong bar. And if you look at John, you can even see a nice strong X shape. During this time interval, two to four giga years, there's a bar forming. At the start of that time interval, you see if I look at the radial velocity dispersion, the very youngest population, all I've done is break, broken all the populations into four bins, just purely because four is as many as I wanted to, to deal with. So the stars that formed in the first half a giga year, the stars that formed in the next half a giga year, et cetera. And if I look at their radial random motions, there is a difference in their radial random motion. So I expect that the formation of the bar uh, and the subsequent evolu evolution will produce a uh, difference in the final density distribution and other properties of these populations. So let's start by looking face on at the galaxy. This is the very oldest stars. You can see that that's quite rounded. If I look at stars that are just less than two years old, uh, younger, this is significantly more elongated. And if I look at the last population that formed during the epoch of bar formation, this is considerably more uh, elongated than that population over there was. And if I compare that with the Milky Way, that might allow me to uh, explain why the very oldest stars don't show a very strong bar, whereas younger stars show a quite strong bar. If we do a similar measurement in the simulation, the observations are the filled symbols here. This is the, the uh, filled black circles are are Alairi. You see that they they have the same approximate distance from us observers down here uh, on both sides of the galaxy. If we look at the oldest stars in the simulation. They also have a relatively flat profile in that region. Instead, the red clump stars. These are the red symbols. These stars are closer to us than those stars. And likewise, in the simulation, these stars are closer to us than those stars over there. And that's basically distant. This is the kinematic fractionation in the plane. If we look at edge on, in this case, in, in cross section to make things even clearer, the very oldest stars are boxy shaped. There isn't much of a hint of an X shape, whereas stars that are somewhat younger are clearly distinctly X or peanut shaped uh, in this case. So this is only a very short distance in time, right? This is formed between zero and 0.5 giga years. This is formed between 3.5 and four giga years. In a very short time span, we can produce populations that because they have different radial random motions because uh, star po stellar populations are constantly being heated by uh, processes taking place within the galaxy, when the bar forms, they're separated out into very different density distributions. If we take our simulation and we split it into the very oldest stars, stars formed in the first giga year versus stars that are formed later, we have a very narrow X shape or very narrow bimodality in the old stars, a much broader bimodality in the younger stars. If we then convolve these different populations with the width of the red clump, the red clumps are not perfect standard candle, they have some width. So the very oldest stars, come out with just a single peak. And as you go to increasingly younger stars, you have this bimodality, uh, which would correspond to the bimodality that we observe in the metal rich stars, which explains the seemingly extremely puzzling observation that only the metal rich stars, uh, maybe also slightly, slightly not so metal rich, slightly subsolar stars uh, display a bimodality, but the metal poor stars do not. In terms of producing a vertical metallicity gradient, the way this is the metallicity map of our simulation, you can see there's a metallicity gradient. 
the way we do that is not by uh, doing anything special to different metals. The way we do it is that different stars of different ages have very different uh, vertical profiles. So this is the metallicity profile of the oldest stars. You see that that's a very weak metallicity gradient. This is the metallicity gradient of the stars that formed just half a giga year later. Again, a very weak gradient. But the oldest stars are the ones that have been levitated, levitated upwards the most because those were the hottest at the time that the bar formed. And I show you that they are in fact thicker. See, if we go back here, these stars are considerably thicker than these stars. Uh, so when we look at the combination of these different populations, the thin, sorry, the, the relatively young stars dominate near the plane. When I say relatively young stars, these would be stars that are about eight giga years old in the Milky Way. But they're relatively young and they dominate near the mid plane. This is Z over here. And further away from the mid plane, the old stars dominate. So overall, we end up with this global metallicity gradient that is uh, reasonably steep and comparable to the one in the Milky Way. We have a comparable uh, sort of age gradient, but we can do a little bit more. This is our map of average ages. Um, if we look at the fraction of stars younger between, between one and four giga years, we only find about, if we ignore the plane, we only find about 5% of stars in the bulge have are, are this young, and that's comparable with what we observe in the Milky Way. 5% or less of these stars have those sorts of ages. Now, if you look in detail at the average age map over here, uh, you have the oldest stars on the minor axis, and then there's sort of this bracketing feature here, uh, which is telling you that um, these are slightly younger stars, uh, and it's more prominent on the near side of the bar. This is the near side of the bar over here than on the far side of the bar. Now this was 2017, this is a prediction. Uh, you can try to produce a map like this uh, using uh, MIRA variables. MIRA variables have periods that are anti-correlated with their ages. Sorry, they have periods that are, yeah, they are anti-correlated with their ages. I said that. Uh, Grady et al using Gaia data in 2020, just last year, produced maps of the uh, old stars and of the relatively young stars. And if you then take uh, a different difference between these two maps and smooth that a little bit, you end up with this map over here, old stars on the minor axis, old stars on the minor axis. And then there are these sort of brackets on the two sides uh, and the near side is stronger than the far side. So that's a very nice, confirmation of a prediction that we made a few years ago uh, from current data coming from Gaia. Um, I want to, I, I'm, I'm running a little bit late here. I want to end with a, with a quick additional prediction and the confirmation of that. Uh, and this is looking at external galaxies. If we look at the metallicity map of the galaxy, if it was seen with the, with the bar side on rather than almost pointing towards us, one of the characteristic features we expect to see is that if we look at a metallicity map, it should be very pinched, even more pinched than the density contours, which here are shown by the red lines. Uh, and then we tested this with this galaxy NGC 4710. This galaxy has a, one of these box peanut bulges. If we look at the metallicity map, this metallicity map was produced by, by Muse at the uh, VLT. The density is shown by these dashed contours. And I think you can see the metallicity contours are these solid contours and the colors, you see those are more pinched than the density itself. So that's another prediction that comes from the simulation uh, that is borne out by observations. I think in order to make it fully a science, you have to make predictions and then you have to verify them observation. And I think we're doing reasonably well over there. There is a hint that Andromeda also has a pinched metallicity distribution, but maybe that's not completely clear at this point. Um, I was going to show very quickly this thing called the Tremaine-Weinberg method because this is something that will appear for those of you that want to try the exercises. Um, I'm going to show this very quickly. This will take us two minutes. Uh, if you're not interested in that, you can you know, maybe stop here. Um, but I'm going to tell you about this Tremaine-Weinberg method, which is a method for measuring the pattern speed of a bar. 
what you do is you take, for any galaxy, if you take slits parallel to the major axis of the disk, and for each one of those slits, you measure the average position and the average velocity, um, and then you plot them against each other, uh, those are related through this equation, and the slope of this relation is just proportional to omega p times sine of the inclination. The inclination you can measure if you assume that the galaxy further out is perfectly circular. So if you a galaxy like this, you assume the galaxy is circular over here. You take five slits that are parallel to the major axis of the galaxy, not of the bar, and you measure the average position and the average velocity for each of these slits, okay? And then you plot them against each other of the average velocity, average position, you fit a line, and the slope is omega p sine nine. And you can do this with simulations and I will, I, I've given you an example of that in the simulations. So for those of you that want to have a go at the, you know, these exercises with simulations, I've produced a trial notebook, which we can go through after questions briefly, and I can take questions in the meantime. And I'll stop there, thank you very much. Sorry for running a little bit over. Thank you very much for that fascinating talk. Uh, can everyone join me in a round of applause for the speaker? If you have any questions, please please uh, type them out in the chat window, and I will uh, pass them on one by one to the. While we wait for uh, people to ask questions, uh, I had a question of my own. Okay. Uh, if we go back to the characteristic mass, uh, which we, uh, which you showed earlier. Yeah. Uh, and you showed its uh, evolution with uh, cosmic epoch or redshift. Yes. I wanted to ask you, how far can we uh, trace this with existing uh, instruments? So at the moment, I wouldn't trust it very much beyond redshift of about one. Uh, I think that I would say that this is early hints that this is not evolving very much. Uh, I would like to see better statistics on this. Uh, but yeah, I wouldn't trust it further than redshift one at the moment. Uh, okay. Are you going to convey the questions to me or? Yes. I yes. think there is a question, yes. Um, can, I, can I ask a question? Yes, sure. <laughs> um, sorry, could you please go back to the, the plot where you show um, the variation of the power fraction um, with the, the H1 mass? Um, sure. I think Air in 2007, it is. Yeah. Sorry, where was that? Uh, yeah, it was earlier, wasn't it? Yes, uh, this. Um, uh, further back, yeah. Um, I further think back. Oh, yeah. Yes, uh, yes. There we go, yeah. So um, when, I, when I saw this, this plot, I was a bit tempted to say that uh, maybe the bar fraction is also uh, there's a correlation between the bar fraction and, and the environment. Um, but then you said that it is simply due to the fact that there's not enough you know, resolution. That's why we see the trend. Now, my, it, probably it's a naive question, but um, is it possible to think that you know, there's, there's indeed a correlation between the environment and, uh, what is it, and the bar fraction? It is possible. There have been studies that have found the, uh, that precise behavior. <clears throat> that the bar fraction depends upon <clears throat> uh, environment. Uh, I'm thinking of papers by Alfonso Gary, Haru Mendes Abreu, and, and friends uh, who, who find behaviors like that. <clears throat> this doesn't necessarily mean, uh, this result that I'm showing you here doesn't necessarily mean that there isn't a dependence on environment. I mean, of course, an environment, one of the effects of environment is that gas is stripped out of galaxies. Yeah. Um, uh, and so potentially, you know, some of that is buried within this gap within this plot. Uh, and then that might mean that, for instance, that the loss of the gas 
does not impact upon the presence of a bar. That's one way of interpreting this. Uh, I'm okay. not sure necessarily that the author of this paper would agree with that, but that is naively one interpretation I could come up with. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Are there any more questions? Uh, if not, uh, let us thank our speaker once more. And uh, we will now go to look at the IPython notebook. Is that correct, Victor? Okay, yeah. So once again, that's where the notebook is. It's called Bar Exercises. It's just on my webpage. The easiest way to get it is to just wget uh, that particular file. Uh, I've pre-opened that, and it looks like this. Okay, uh, it refers to a model that was called model R1 in this paper. Uh, you will need a file, which you can get from here. Okay, uh, that is a published model. So if you wanted to use that model for doing something with your science, you're perfectly free to do that. You don't need to acknowledge, well, you need to acknowledge me, but you don't need to include me in a paper or anything like that. Um, and so what I've done here is just a few simple questions of things you can do with a model like this. So I've already um, got the file locally. So I'm going to show you what you can do with this. So that's just a bunch of imports. There's nothing very exciting there. When you download the file, you will download this file. This is a text file, okay? Uh, in fact, why don't I show you the text file? Uh, it's got X, Y, Z, V, X, V, Y, V, Z. It's got six columns. X, Y, Z is in kiloparsecs and the velocities are in kilometers per second. This is a way of reading that text file. What I'm doing here is after you read it the first time, you save it as a file called data. And then the next time you come around, you can comment this out. Uh, let's just do this. Uh, we can comment this out, okay, and then read this file instead. Okay. I've already done this for myself. Uh, the reason why you do that is it's vastly faster. There you go, I've read it, okay. And then there are a number of things I'm asking you to do. And in the first, in the first cell, I ask you, please plot the density of the galaxy. And so I've already written that code for you. And when I run this, that's what happens if you want to comment this line, you save the image that results somewhere. And then I ask you to do a number of things with the simulation. Use the next cell to produce density plots in the XZ and YZ plane. So I've plotted XY here, reproducing the XZ and YZ is not much different. You can literally take this code. Oops, let's just copy this code, okay? Uh, for instance, you can do this. You won't have this in your in your version, but let's do the XZ. And if we save it, let's change that to XZ. Okay, and if I run again, uh, that's not running. Uh, and you might want to fix the uh, axis ratios, of course, because this is now plotting as a square. You don't want it to plot as a square any longer. You can already see by eye a very clear X shape in there. Okay. Um, and you can do the same for X, Y, et cetera, et cetera. So that's, you know, exercise two, if you want to call it that. Use the next cell to rotate about the Z axis and then plot uh, in the X, Z space. So you will need to figure out how to rotate coordinates. You will need to multiply by a rotation matrix, not particularly hard to do, to in order to rotate by 20 degrees and then another 20 degrees, et cetera, and plot one of these each time. The reason you do that is because you'll see the X shape come and go as you do that. Um, and uh, I, I will show you an example of this actually somewhere else briefly. Uh, then there is use the next cell to plot the average radial and average tangential velocities in the X, Y plane. Uh, and when you do that, what you should see is that the radial velocities will be relatively large at 45 degrees to the bar, more or less. 
uh, and smaller elsewhere. That is something that will tell you about the streaming motions of the, of the stars. So that's the radial velocities. And then I say for the edge on view and the XZ and YZ plane, compute the line of sight velocities and decide which of these two has more cylindrical rotation. Cylindrical rotation means that the velocity dispersion, sorry, the velocity is roughly constant on vertical lines. So uh, try that. Uh, I ask you to also do the radial and tangential velocity dispersions as a function of radius. Uh, and then I ask you to rotate the bar about the z-axis by 45 degrees and then incline the entire galaxy by 45 degrees and plot the velocities. And then you will use that to do the Tremaine-Weinberg method that I showed you towards the end. Hopefully you can go back to the recording of the, of the lecture to figure out what that is. Uh, it's not very hard. Um, then I ask you to move, sorry, then I ask you to produce an unsharp mask. I remind you an unsharp mask of a galaxy is something that looks, I, I give you an exercise for producing something. Nope, not this, like this, okay? Produce an unsharp mask of the galaxy. The galaxy that you will be working with is a scaled version of this simulation. It's a quite old simulation at this point, but it's still useful because it's, quite similar to the Milky Way. So that, that is uh, this, this question. Then from here onwards, we're going to pretend that we're looking at the Milky Way. First, you're going to rotate the bar to the Milky Way's orientation, and you plot the density again in longitude, latitude coordinates. In this question, I ask you to Identify those regions where you see a density by modality along the line of sight. Then uh, from the solar perspective, again, plot the average radial velocity and the average distance. And then finally, I ask you, this is a harder question, go to this paper and do a Tremaine Weinberg in the Milky Way. This has only been done twice in the Milky Way, once by myself in this paper and more recently using Gaia and VVV data. Uh, this is something that uh, is a little bit more involved, but maybe a little bit fun to play with to see what, what results. And that's the sort of exercises that I suggested you try. They're, they're useful for people who haven't uh, used simulations before to give you some sense of what you can do with simulations. In principle, these are, this is something that you can do in maybe one day, let's say. It's not a really hard exercise. Um, and by all means, if you do anything else with this, if you want to publish papers, like I said, you're free to do that. This simulation was used uh, in, a, in a version of um, the Besançon galaxy model. So the kinematics are reasonably good. Uh, it's, a, it's a reasonable model to play around with a little bit and experiment. And I think that's it. And then in a, in a week or two, at a time to be determined, uh, we can all meet again if you want, and we can have a look at, uh, you know, what you produced, and we can all chat a little bit about our solutions to these problems. That's it. Thank you so much, Victor. Uh, the discussion session for this uh, notebook is scheduled on the 28th of uh, April at the usual Wednesday stop slot, uh, and the invitation for that will be uh, sent shortly. So I hope you all to uh, see there to discuss the notebook and the exercise given there. Uh, with this, I'll stop recording now and I'll stay online while everyone talks. Thank you very much for uh, attending the talk. And thank you, Victor, for giving such a wonderful talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, <laughs> thank you Victor. Yeah, you're welcome.